distinguished visitor is Dr. Steve Running, who's an emeritus professor at the University of Montana. Um, this is a, one of our VIP seminars from the Climate Center, and uh, we're grateful to the Climate Center for doing all of the organization and actually getting Steve here. Um, I'm Dave Schimmel, the group soup for the Carbon and Ecosystems Group, and Steve and I have been colleagues essentially as long as it's been, as long as it's possible to be colleagues. I was a first year graduate student the year he graduated from Colorado State, and we met several times because I was taking a class from his major professor. Steve's accomplishments are many. This is a figure, this is the first color figure published in the discipline of ecology, and it's one of the very first regional models ever done, and you can see the incredible sophistication, the, the subtle contouring and shading to show different rates of evapotranspiration corresponding to variation in leaf area and insulation. Steve's such a pioneer that many of the things he pioneered are actually forgotten today, like IBM 8286 PCs. I, I actually had to look them up to remind myself what they looked like. They were giant boxes that sat on your desk and hummed. And he actually took one of them to the field. He probably needed a pack mule to carry it out there because, of course, laptops hadn't been invented in the Stone Age. And I think most of us know Steve scientifically from developing the Mod 17 algorithm, which is really, in, in, I think, in fundamental ways, it's the foundation of what we might call global ecology today. And uh, I doubt that there's a, a scientist working in, in, uh, in uh, the carbon cycle and terrestrial ecology who hasn't used this product for one thing or another, even if it was just to laugh at it. Yeah, that's right. Steve and I have worked together on a number of projects. This is a figure uh, from a paper debunking another paper in Science Magazine, <laughs> uh, looking at the carbon balance of North America and showing that the net effect circa 1990-something of increasing CO2 was actually fairly small, given the background of other disturbances that were going on at the time. And uh, this one, unfortunately, you can't see. This, is a, th this was the money paper of all time. This was a two-page article in EOS that Steve and I wrote in about an hour and a quarter, which resulted in a $4 million field campaign. So I, I view this paper as one of the best investments <laughs> of all time. Steve can be controversial. <laughs> and in his home state of Montana, because he has a parking place, identifying him as one of the co-recipients of the 2007 Peace Prize, he's produced a lot of outrage from the local folks. <laughs> and uh, one of them said that he was not only a liar, he was a psychopathic liar. <laughs> I chose not to put that on the slide. I just have to say, since you're about to listen to him give a scientific talk, it has not been my experience that he's a psychopathic liar. <laughs> he had a major influence on my career um, when I was thinking about leaving a certain institution and moving to the National <laughs> Center for it? Atmospheric Research, Steve sent me this email, which I actually found in the NCAR archives last oh, week. Oh, in the original courier font that was used by the NASA Omnet email system, another thing that Steve <laughs> pioneered and is now long and happily forgotten. So finally, one of his names is Doehead Longthong, and many people have asked why this is. I was also able to find the part of the origin of this in the NCAR files. Steve wrote a review of the original proposal for NCAR's climate system modeling project, which resulted in what was called CE CSMP and then CSM and now CESM. And he was skeptical of his level of effort in that review because he really didn't find much to criticize. And he said he might be kind of a doughhead as a result. <laughs> but about that same time, he and I went to a workshop at Snowbird and we went skiing in the afternoon. And Steve had the oldest pair of ski bindings I had ever seen on a human being. <laughs> Ones that even when they were new were pretty much guaranteed to break your leg. Um, where you basically tied your heel to the ski with leather <laughs> yeah. straps but your toe could pop out, and that meant that if you fell, the ski would spin around and beat you to death. 
That's right. And uh, that's, those aren't Steve's marker long thongs. Those are just a generic pair of marker long thongs. Uh -huh. So with this brief recap of, of Steve's career, I want to say just a couple of serious things. <laughs> um, Steve was one of the founding team that uh, conceived of and then over a very long period of time executed the EOS program. And uh, he and I worked together closely at the origin of that. It was how I was drawn into remote sensing. And um, it was a lot of hard work. It was an exciting, um, turbulent time. And it's hard to think today of how challenging it was with those two, three big birds just calmly orbiting the planet, delivering data. Um, there were many times, for example, the $17 billion to $11 billion D-scope, when it was not at all obvious that there would ever be a day when data was just raining from the sky from Terra Aqua and Aura. So uh, we all owe Steve a, a big debt together with the other founding fathers of the program, and I'll turn it over to him now. That's right, find me some real material to work from. Yeah, I still remember in probably the mid-1990s, imagining, will these EOS platforms ever fly? Because at, at that time, we'd already been thinking and planning for a decade. And we still weren't, we were still years from launch. And you started wondering, is this ever going to pan out? And uh, luckily, luckily did. And uh, it's pretty amazing, still going. So I started out in uh, what you might say pure tree physiology. So when you, when you think of ecological scaling, I've gone from one end to the other. And so this is what I was doing my master's thesis on, putting little twigs in this cuvette and measuring their transpiration rates. And when you do something as, what should we say, mundane or esoteric as this, you never imagine you'll ever talk publicly. The public certainly doesn't care about stomatal conductance of, of trees. And, uh, and, and I think back, I had no sense, certainly no preparation or training for ever talking to the public with uh, my, my scientific upbringing. And hopefully nowadays, our young scientists understand that they will probably be giving public talks, and it'll be really important that they do them well. Now, turns out I almost ended up working here twice. And, and in fact, and now that I'm, I guess, semi-retired, I'll say, professionally I would have taken the jobs in a minute, but I just couldn't imagine how I could live in the LA basin. I mean, I was terrified getting from Burbank Airport to Pasadena last night. And uh, so this is, a, this is a, a, a level of human density that I'm not built for. Let's just put it that way. And so uh, a couple of, take a, just a few minutes of history of how I ended up with that. Um, in 1984 or so, they had they'd built here the first airborne imaging spectrometer, AIS, and it was flying on a C-130. And uh, Barry Rock, that a few of you might uh, remember, and I cooked up this experiment to test whether this AIS could, could detect canopy stress. And of course, these engineers didn't really know much about tree stress, but I did. That's what I did my dissertation on, literally, was water stress of lodgepole pine trees under drought. And so uh, when we wanted to do this study, I said, well, let's induce the stress to make real sure we have serious stress. And so this was called the Chainsaw Massacre around NASA headquarters. We chainsaw girdled all these spruce trees. This was in uh, Munich. And then had both flyovers and uh, the hand spectrometry. The other part of the experiment, they had forest workers. You can't 
quite see, but they actually cut every tree off and then dropped it to the ground and lashed it up. And so they did this for a couple of thousand trees. And of course, uh, in Germany, if you're a professor, you don't run chainsaws. So I sat in a Mercedes drinking coffee with the other professors while the, the workers did all that. I wonder what they were telling their friends. You wouldn't believe what these science nerds are doing now. And uh, of course, the, the, the result of this was there was too much seen heterogeneity to really be able to detect with the AIS of the time this stress. And that's what I expected is it really wouldn't be detectable. Now the next time I almost took a job here was about a decade later and um, it was Joe B. Way and maybe Kyle McDonald and they had just flown in SCAT over uh, this transect in Alaska and um, they just happened to to mention to me that uh, in this wavelength that the, the surface freezing and thawing was just easily detectable. It was like black and white in the optical spectrum. And they just kind of mentioned that matter of factly. I go, what? Now you say you can really just nail that? Do you realize that that is like an on off switch for hydrology and ecosystems? And so I cooked up this uh, conceptual, uh, you might say, uh, thought piece of how in meteorology, hydrology, and in ecology, the freeze-thaw transition is a really big deal. And that if we could monitor that without sunlight and through the clouds in high latitudes, that would be a really big deal. Does anybody here remember the FrostSat mission concept? Nope. <laughs> this on does. And so the mistake JPL made is they made me a PI. And so this had a nice science concept, but I am not an electrical engineer or a sensor designer or anything else. And so it never got very far in the, in the mission competitions. But the free saw concept carried through to Hydros, and then carried through ultimately to SMAP, which probably a lot of you know is flying to this day. And so this freeze-thaw idea, I still think, will someday make a very good global monitor of a certain aspect of the Earth's surface dynamic. I don't think they're doing it yet. When I uh, proposed to be on the SMAP team, I was rejected, so I haven't done much since on that topic. Um, but what I have done is cop some of Simon's LST, except this is before he took uh, responsibility for the MODIS land surface temperature. I've always found LST just to be interesting, and, and I've never got a dime of funding from headquarters. I can't remember how many proposals I wrote to do LST science, and not one of them has ever been funded, so these are all freebies. And the one thing that we had great fun doing, it wasn't cutting edge science theory, but finding the hottest place on earth. And boy, did the press love that. Every year for a number of years, we'd put out a new map of the hottest place on earth. And uh, usually, and in a number of times, the place that won would email me. And they were proud of it and wanted to put it in their chamber of commerce material. And so it got kind of boring when the loot desert of Iran won about five years in a row. And so it isn't much of a competition anymore. This is what it looks like. Or is this Mars? I can't tell which. I mean, this is, the, some Iranian scientists emailed me and said, would you like to see pictures of this loot desert you've identified? And this is it. This is, this is for real. I've never been there. But, and it uh, uh, was, uh, computed as 70 degrees, but that was with probably a suspect emissivity factor, and we've never done it with your new product yet. It's probably way colder now, right? But it was sure fun to do, and boy, the public really liked it. Uh, and the other thing about LST, when you look generally, is it actually tells you a lot about land cover. Here in the Bight of Africa, you can go from 
the Saharan Desert down into the rainforest in a matter of a few hundred kilometers and have spectacular gradient of maximum LST. And so, so we still dabble with this. This is my old student David Mildrexler's AGU poster of just a couple of months ago. And uh, uh, an LST, a maximum LST map. And one of the things that I, I find interesting is if you just do a histogram of this maximum LST year by year, you actually get a different measure of uh, global surface temperature and surface cover. And it's kind of an abstract one. It's hard to know how to interpret it, but it, it sure is something different than our normal look at our land surfaces. So these are all JPL-led things that over the years I, I've, I've worked on. And I probably should have come here and done it from here, but I didn't. So uh, let's go back to what I did work on. This is what we knew about global net primary production when I started. And uh, I find this just hysterical to look at. And this is Inez Fung and uh, Jim Tucker, and I'm trying to remember who else on the on this paper, and, and their look at the time of what we knew about global NPP. Well, I looked at that and thought, well, gee, this is not going to be very hard to, to beat this. And um, this was the aha moment of my whole career. Jim Tucker had just sent me NDVI data sets for some study sites that I was building my early biome BGC model on. And I just put one on top of the other and put my simulated photosynthesis and transpiration for the year against the NDVI trace that uh, Jim and sent. And when I popped this up in my Quattro Pro graphics and saw this, I immediately knew that this NDVI was something that we better figure out. And of course, nowadays, this sounds pretty hokey. But back then, we just didn't really understand what NDVI was telling us about a system. And so this was, to me, told me right away that there, this tracks an ecosystem as well as anything we've ever found. And it's being done by satellite worldwide. This sounds quite promising. And so as I launched into what became Mod 17, uh, it was starting from this idea that uh, with some spectral index from the satellite, maybe all I had to do is come up with some nice um, climate scalers. And on a global scale, I'd be home free. And of course, all I had to do was beat Inez's graph back there, right? And so I started with some really simple concepts about what controls um, plant activity. And this comes straight out of you know, sophomore plant physiology, light, light temperature water sort of level. And so I re realized, well, I can calculate solar radiation and a potential radiation anywhere on Earth. And uh, then with a cloud cover scaler, I can deal with that. Um, Temperature we can <coughs> get from any number of, uh, of uh, separate sources. We don't use the MODIS LST alone. That was something I was going to try, but it's way too sporadic because of cloud cover. So we were taking in the feed of what now is the GMAO data stream. So radiation and temperature daily were easy to come by. And the water stress part was harder, and that was what I knew the best scientifically, but was also uh, trickiest. I ended up using vapor pressure deficit rather than a water balance because it was more stable back in the 1990s as a measure of aridity. And just put that, those all together uh, and come up with this kind of mix of climate scalers for the whole world. And recognize, even though my PhD was in plant physiology, I hadn't bothered with any physiology yet. I figured, let's get the climate scalers right. And, and really, the final bit of physiology was, I won't say an afterthought. I thought about it a lot. But I couldn't think of any common principle that I could use globally at the time. 
And so with these, I could come up with a growing season length for anywhere on Earth from pure climate scalars, no ecosystem data at all in, in this. And um, then I won't bother going through these algorithms. If you've worked with this, you've seen them forever. Um, but simply to get daily gross prim primary production, you were measuring the fraction of absorbed par, and uh, all, the, all the ecology was in this epsilon conversion factor. And um, then net primary production was simply the summation of those daily GPPs for the year minus some respiration scalars. And um, that's what I proposed to NASA in 1988 for MODIS. What I found out later is nobody in the whole country proposed anything beyond vegetation indices for EOS, nobody on any sensor. And so I ended up having no competition for putting these advanced vegetation products into, into EOS. And of course now these are done every day and we've, uh, we've done many of these maps and they're they're around. We've had a couple of science papers uh, looking at the trends of them, and, and this is now, as Dave said, kind of a foundation of carbon, global scale carbon cycle science. Now, in the, in the intervening years, and uh, this is NEMA's PhD, or NEMA will raise your hand so you get proper, uh, <laughs> proper. Uh, uh, um, credit for your work uh, because in the beginning I just set simple scalars for the little red dot is the, the fixed scalar I use for each biome type. Uh, uh, and this was uh, simply the grams of carbon fixed per megajoule of energy absorbed by the system. And, um, and of course at launch this was perfectly good enough. But now we're 15, 20 years later and NEMA and a number of people have, have uh, started analyses of what true variability there is in these biomes in this uh, conversion efficiency, uh, both uh, within biome by species and ecotype and by seasonality. And uh, so the next generation of this is uh, of this algorithm will determine an optimal um, step forward in, in making, making this algorithm uh, more realistic. But uh, uh, this has been a long time coming to even get these uh, functional traits uh, to uh, ready to go, and we, we're not programming these for the end of MODIS. Uh, basically, NASA doesn't want any new algorithms for the MODIS land team at this point. I mean, we're going to coast to the finish line in about two years. MODIS Terra runs out of gas, and so uh, uh, none of these enhancements to the Epsilon calculation are going to happen for the official product. But of course, that doesn't mean that any of us can't be working for future purposes on next generations of a Mod 17 algorithm. Uh, my, uh, my postdoc, Alvaro Moreno, this is his uh, poster from AGU last year, is also working on uh, new ways of, of defining functional plant traits. This particular one is the specific leaf area and looking at the variability worldwide of specific leaf area, which of course I always knew existed back then, but I had no idea how I could ever parameterize them back in the 1990s. But I think in the coming years, uh, these are the sort of things that are going to be coming next for doing global NPP. And so one of the things that we've uh, done with our Mod 17 uh, data set, this is an example we did for the National Climate Assessment. And just looking at the interannual variability of uh, how well we, we quantify drought and, uh, and uh, 
wet periods across the country. And of course, even, even um, without any new enhancements to the algorithm, we're already capable of, of seeing this kind of interannual variability quite clearly at continental scales. And so this, uh, uh, compared to Inez's uh, NPP of 1983, uh, we've come a long way. Uh, this particular one, uh, looking at the, in, the dependence of terrestrial NPP on the La Nina, there's a story that I find very useful of how this paper happened. I was sitting a, at maybe at an AGU talk in 2012, it must have been, and um, some ocean people said, you know the La Nina has been so strong that sea level rise stopped this year? And I thought, really? Where did all that water go? Well, no doubt it went and rained on the land. So I thought, geez, I wonder if our NPP w would be able to see that. And so Anna Bassus, a postdoc that was in my lab at the time, uh, went after that and sure enough found that the La Nina signal that they spotted in sea level rise, we were able to spot, had enhanced NPP in arid lands, uh, arid savannas all over the world. And to me, it was just such a cool illustration of ocean atmosphere land coupling that I would have never thought to ask this question if I hadn't been listening to the oceanographers. We have worked over the years also in trying to monitor drought better. We do have an evapotranspiration product that's a companion to the MODIS uh, NPP. Uh, people have asked me why it took so long to get my ET Mod 16 going. I was actually told by headquarters in about 2003 to concentrate on the carbon cycle, not the water cycle by Diane Wickland. And she said, we want you to get the carbon science going at a higher priority than the water cycle. So the ET product kind of sat uh, on the shelf for a long time, which is too bad. We end up with a nice cover of BAMS a few years ago. And, uh, and we're still working on better ways to quantify drought impact on the daily GPP without having to do a full water balance of the system because that then requires not only a good precipitation data set but also a good soil moisture um, uh, 1D calculation that we can do at small areas but I don't think we could do well enough uh, globally. All right, well let's go back to the NPP and um, we ran the algorithm for, for the old AVHR record, also then for our MODIS record is, are the red lines, and this is running the same algorithm, but for the Jim Tucker's NDVI data set since 1982. And um, of course the big, the big issue that everybody was looking at is, gee, is, is global NPP going up or down? Do we see a trend up or down? And it would appear that it's going up by a little bit. But what I, as I looked at this, it occurred to me that maybe the most interesting conclusion of this graph is not so much whether it's going up or down because it isn't going any big trend in any big hurry. You can see this uh, y-axis is only from 51 to 54. This is only about 2% variance per year in the, in the NPP and I thought maybe the bigger, the more important conclusion here is how little interannual variability there is in global NPP. Plus or minus 2% is not very big for a dynamic system. And uh, this was about the time that the planetary boundary uh, idea had been uh, published by Johan Rockström and a big crowd in Nature back in 2009. 
And one of the things that they were missing in their paper was any carbon cycle measurement. They had, they had uh, uh, ideas for a lot of all these other topics, but when it came to uh, carbon cycle, they really did not have anything that directly evaluated the carbon cycle. And I thought, well, we do have a global NPP data set, and it's interesting to question whether this stability might actually be a, a serious constraint or whether it just is, is kind of happenstance. So I started thinking through, well, could it be that there's a planetary boundary to NPP that would be important? And so uh, I wrote a commentary for science on this. This is in 2012 where I uh, talked through the, the data set we had and uh, the, the mean NPP uh, of the world, and then how much of it actually is available for any new, uh, new utility, let's just call it. And what I found was that when you looked at the 50, roughly 53 pedograms of uh, plant production that uh, the world does uh, annually, and started partitioning out what might be available for humans to, to use. Uh, it turned out that, the, that a lot of it uh, disappeared quickly. Now first, about 15 petagrams of it is growth below ground. So unless it's carrots or potatoes, uh, you're not gonna do much with that. Um, another about 20 petagrams uh, we're already using for agriculture and grazing and, uh, and, uh, well, pro and wood products. And, and so we're, they're already being consumed by humanity. And then about 13 petagrams were, in our measure, unavailable. And what that really meant is it would take more energy to go out and harvest than you would, would receive back in product. And that basically means all the semi-arid land of the whole world which I, we've come, oh yeah, it's on here, 33 million square kilometers of global landscape. The NPP is so, so sparse, you know, open, arid uh, uh, grasslands and deserts that you could never even go harvest it, process it, and get as much as it took to go get it. So it really isn't available. Well, the bottom line of this was that only about five petagrams out of 53, only about 10% of the biospheric production we saw is actually still being potentially available for human use. So instead of this idea that we had still had a huge big planet left that we could go exploit if we needed to, this suddenly started to look like, geez, maybe we're kind of close to a planetary boundary in plant production already. Now, as I thought through this and thought whether this was even a, a reasonable theory to uh, pursue, one thing was clear. Um, solar energy input really is quite constant. We measure that very accurately. And so you can say on a planetary basis that we are getting near steady uh, solar energy input. The precipitation was more interesting. And this has been, um, I haven't updated this for a good while, but uh, what I was finding was that uh, the best estimates of global rain and snowfall every year were very stable. Basically, when it's a drought somewhere, somewhere else it's raining. By the time you add and subtract all the rain and snowfall around the world, it seemed like it's all pretty constant, which was, an, an interesting conclusion that would certainly support the idea that maybe NPP could be uh, similarly constant. Now the two variables that I did not directly evaluate are the increasing CO2, which enhances photosynthesis, we know, and the increasing nitrogen deposition that on a global basis could be providing a nutrient enhancement for an awful lot of land area that little by little would be increasing that uh, NPP. Well, uh, over the last, so this 
I wrote that paper in 2012, so that's, what, six, seven years ago. Uh, since then, a few papers have come out, actually a fair number of papers, showing various attributes of, in, in this case, greening. This is simply looking at the, the leaf area index, I think is what their, their measure is they're using, uh, from a couple of different data sets and saying, yes, the trend over this 30-year period was for greening. Uh, another similar paper with a combination of both modeling uh, and um, the satellite-driven data sets also shows a little bit of greening, as we call it. Um, here's another paper. I could give you a lot more of these papers. I'm not going to, but uh, another paper that suggests that the terrestrial biosphere does appear to be getting a bit more active. Um, when I say a bit more active, though, um, it's kind of hard to say specifically whether we're enhancing net primary production, which is you know, actual tissue growth, or net ecosystem exchange, which is our net CO2 flux. And those are the two things that basically want to be known, is NPP and NEE. And uh, so all of these trends of things like greening uh, are still one step short of what policy-wise is important for us to know. And so I continue to, to watch this, uh, these trends, uh, and I continue to think back of whether this concept of NPP being a planetary boundary is, is useful at all uh, and, and is, is real. There's certainly a number of policy-related um, topic areas where it's relevant, certainly in climate stabilization uh, with terrestrial CO2 source sinks, uh, bioenergy, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, food security I'm also going to talk about in a minute, and then, of course, the terrestrial carbon source sink. So uh, thinking through whether there might be a boundary on an NPP or not seems to me worth doing. The answer might be that there's no boundary, that it could just keep, uh, keep getting larger uh, forever, but I, do, I don't think so. But that's, that's certainly the alternative argument. One of the things we looked at just a few years ago was whether the CO2 enhancement that the GCMs have in their terrestrial models, the basically the CO2 fertilizer effect, as they call it, was looked about right. And so we took this data set from 1982 to, I think, 2011, and uh, looked at the model trajectories of CO2 enhancements from CMIP-5 data, and then just compared it with our NPP trend that we were seeing from our satellite-driven NPP calculation. And basically, the, the bottom line here is, is that our satellite trajectory is going up a bit, but it's going up a lot slower than the model CO2 fertilization effects. Now this this is significant because if the models are too enthusiastic in enhancing the terrestrial uh, photosynthesis than is real, then these projections out to 2100 of CO2 uptake helping to slow down uh, the atmospheric CO2 increase in, in the temperature warming um, would, would basically be taking us the wrong way. In other words, it's, it's going to warm faster than we thought because the terrestrial biosphere won't be helping as much as our models think they are. So when this paper came out, I think uh, the modeling teams paid attention to this. I hope they're looking at this carefully because it sure looks like for us that their fertilization effect is, is a bit too enthusiastic, let's call it. And then there's bioenergy. About, let's see, when, it was, it was shortly after that 2012 pair, I think about 
Yeah, right around there. I started reading these uh, energy, global energy projections for the future. So notice this one goes out to, to 2100. And this is by a, a bunch of economists. Now, there wouldn't be any economist here, would there? I didn't think so. I'm probably safe in an audience at JPL, because I'm going to say mean things about economists. And uh, basically, these economists were trying to project forward the energy sources of the future. And what I was seeing in some of these papers was this huge big wedge for bioenergy. <coughs> and so they were suggesting a bioenergy of 425 exajoules per year by the end of the century. And I thought to myself, geez, I probably have the best data set of global plant production. I wonder if those numbers are realistic or not. And so we went and found out. And so we had a paper, the, the, the best paper was in bioscience. You see the title there, Global Bioenergy Capacity as Constrained by Observed NPP. And to, to go past the details here, this is a stack of economist papers quoting, uh, basically projecting the bioenergy capacity that was in their economic models. And you see some of them as high, my God, is 1,500 exajoules. And lots of them up in the five and 600 exajoule, range, exajoule per year range. Well, we went through kind of like the planetary boundary analysis and what we thought might be possible. And I won't even say realistic, I'll just say possible. We came up with about 100 exajoules of energy for that, for, that could be used for bioenergy on a global basis. And remember that graph before was talking about four times as much. Some of these were talking about 10 times as much. And we didn't in any way see that uh, that kind of bioenergy capacity was possible. I, I think what these economists do is they must go and look up papers on redwoods and then imagine the whole world's covered with redwoods that they're going to clear cut every year. Because that's kind of about the numbers it would take to generate the bioenergy that they were projecting. And to me, it's a great illustration as we, we move into the future of where different disciplines need to occasionally to pay attention to each other. Because if they would just uh, read this paper of ours in bioscience, they would know that anything over a couple of hundred exajoules of bioenergy, they're just talking crazy talk. And uh, yet, um, there, I'm still seeing papers on economic energy forecast with just moon being bioenergy. And so I don't think they read the paper. And I know the issue this came out in the editor of Bioscience pointed out the paper and said, this paper is a big deal. And uh, how many economists read even one issue of Bioscience? And so another part of this question, I think you're seeing this pattern where I've, I've kind of moved, especially in these last years of my career, from kind of the raw algorithm development and data set production into does any of our data set have any policy relevance is really what I've spent more of my time on. And so another part of it is, is the f food security issue that I've kind of fallen into the edge of. And so here's a projection forward for, from a food security uh, journal um, of reduction in global food production per capita over the coming couple of decades. I mean, where the lines go straight is where the projections start, of course. And you see every one of them is down for every part of the world. And this suggests that at least the food security people don't think we can retain the global food production at a rate that will even keep up with global population growth. Now, whether that 
ends up true or not remains to be seen. But to me, it's another illustration where uh, data sets like mine hopefully will help them get to these answers uh, uh, quicker. Because these are important, these are, these are massive human uh, policy and uh, uh, human health and viability issues. Uh, actually, global habitability was a title NASA headquarters used in the early 80s for a couple years. And these are perfect examples of global habitability science issues. Of course, one dimension of this that I'm not going to talk on in detail is, is how much of the world is, is going to have sufficient hydration for particularly the kind of irrigation that, that's going on. And uh, definitely, we've learned from grace how many parts of the world the groundwater depletion is absolutely unsustainable. We know that. Now, one of the things I have the most fun when I give public talks is I, is I basically, um, I, I bait the audience and, I, and, I, and I'll show them a groundwater map and I'll, a, global, a global groundwater map and I'll tell them, how do you think we measured this? And they, it just blows their mind when you say, well, we measured groundwater with a satellite. They just go nuts. And uh, I'd have to say Byron Tapley had to explain to me about five times before it finally, oh, that's exactly how it works. So, um, but I can at least uh, explain it to a public audience now. And of course, all of us in, in global water security know that uh, we don't think we can retain the surface, what do I want to say, surface hydration that's going on right now. That probably major agricultural regions are going to blink out in about the next, what, decade? And so uh, uh, that comes, of course, back to food security on a, on a global basis. And so I've started thinking more and more about how the Mod 17 NPP data set, how it can get us closer to some of these questions of can we compute a net ecosystem some exchange good enough to be selling carbon credits for? Can we compute an NPP good enough to imagine defining uh, biofuel, bioenergy uh, production and consumption? I mean, these are the sort of things where we move from geeky science of, of an uh, NPP algorithm to real world uh, 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 questions that uh, our, our political leaders are having to, to struggle with. And of course, the climate part of it, we're well familiar with that uh, the, the land carbon sink is, is an important part of us keeping the trajectory of CO2 increase no hot, faster than it already is. And if that sink got measurably smaller we, the, the warming trend would be faster. And so we come to, I'm sure everybody in this audience has seen these, this graph. Uh, we come to this array of futures. And one of the things I've learned that you have to explain to the public, they all think this is model error. They think these models are useless. Look, at they just kind of spray across the page. What I have to t explain to them, no, that's human error. <laughs> this is where humans are going to decide what's going to happen to the world until the rest of the century. And they may decide to end up down here at RCP 2.6, but they might decide to be at 8.5 or anywhere in between. <clears throat> and uh, so this is just how the models translate the uncertainty of how smart or dumb humanity is going to be in the coming uh, century to where we end up. And I bring this right back to the very first book that I read on, on a global topic like this, The Limits to Growth. Look at what I paid for that book, $2.75. And I still have it. To me, it's my most valued book in my library. And they basically, with the most 
comical model you've ever seen basically identified all this in 1972. And what we're doing now is, is refining the projections and giving lots more details. But the bottom line, the punchline, they had in 1972. And uh, the cartoon version of it is kind of like this. This is from the World Economic Forum about a month ago. Climate change is now the talk of Davos. I hope we, the big collective earth science we, uh, I hope we occasionally step back from the details of our algorithms and our parameterizations and our uncertainty analysis and realize the responsibility we have to humanity. This is something that when your hair gets this color, you start thinking about things like this. We are a very tiny handful of people on Earth with the capability to be monitoring the planet in extremely critical ways. And we've got to be paying attention how to best deliver what they need to know to our political leaders and to our public. And I think you're seeing that i am spent in the last few years, a fair bit of time trying to get past my simple NPP data set into some of these very critical issues of what the capacity of the global carbon cycle is to support humanity. And I know we don't think about this very often because in a way you can't. You've got day-to-day -day details you got to work on uh, in, in your, your science. But every once in a while, we need to keep this in mind that how are we going to help humanity stay from that RCP 8.5 trajectory? Because that really is, in the next couple of decades, our most important responsibility to the world. So thank you. That's it. So I'll thank you so much. If you have any, if you have any questions, um, let me give you the microphone first, because otherwise you won't be heard on our recording of this, which we're, which we're doing. So if you ask a question, it'll be on our recording. Does anybody have any questions? See, for the planetary boundary layers um, and bioenergy bio production or capacity, uh, you ruled out a lot of the semi-arid and grassland areas because of not enough water. Um, and then, you know, the question would be, what, what about groundwater pumping? But of course, that's not sustainable. What about lateral transport of water across surfaces? Have you, would that be considered an option where, as you said, precip, if it's pretty much steady, moving it from wet to, to dry in as much as there's telecom, oil, gas, pipeline, and so on? You know, when you start taking a real global look, you realize that might be important in a, in a few areas here and there, but it just would not add up to much globally in the end. And moving water laterally takes energy. We know it's a lot of work. And so I think from a food security point of view, that might be important in keeping some of these areas where their groundwater might blink out. That might keep them going. But I think in, a, in the larger scale, I don't think that would add up to much. It's actually pretty amazing how small an area of the land surface is irrigated. You probably know this number better than I do. I think it's only 6% or something like that. It isn't a big, it isn't a big area. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, I have a question. It seems like with the observations that you showed, the observations are getting better and better with the new satellite data and better algorithms. The models are also becoming m more and more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, however, it seems still, and correct me if I'm wrong, the integration of the model and data is a very slow process. So if you agree that that's the case, what do you think are the major blocks 
in really getting this thing moving forward. I'm glad that you, without prompting, asked that. Because I've gotten, you know, it, we've both lived through the whole EOS era, and I've gotten the exact same feeling that back before launch, when there were no satellites up, we all met for these big meetings, the modelers, the mission teams. We did all this Earth system uh, theory and science. Then we launched the missions, and we all just kind of went off to our corner to, to run, our, uh, run our, our satellites and our data sets. I, I think the integration with Earth system modeling has really atrophied over the last decade or so. And I'm now co-chairing the Academy's Committee on Earth Science, and I'm intending to see if I can figure a way to help that. Because I've seen the, exactly the same thing, is that uh, we're over in our corners generating our global data sets. The modeling teams are off doing their modeling. They're both getting better. Yeah, there's more data sets, certainly, and there's more models, and they're better models, but I'm not convinced there's near cross-fertilization that, that we imagined 20 years ago there would be. Mm, this is an easier audience than I thought it'd be. Because there are no economists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I always have to ask if there's economists before I say anything mean. But they really pay no attention to reality. They're, they just take their regression models and push them off into the future, and they have no sense if the numbers are meaningful. And yet economists are, are the ones that run the, the policy of the country. They make a lot more than we do, too. Yep. And their models are lousier. No other questions? All right, I think we should, oh, you have a question? OK, one more. Um, I was interested in the bioenergy question, and I was wondering if you've compared your results um, with the NPP product with the billion ton assessment. How, with, with the billion ton assessment? The, oh, yeah. We didn't, we didn't directly because what we wanted to do is stay at a high level of just what's what's possible in over biospheric capacity. The bioenergy topic gets very complicated quickly when you start drilling down into details of what kind of things are you going to grow and, uh, and of course, where are you going to grow them. And we decided we didn't, we didn't want to get that far down. We wanted to just understand if this top level capacity was possible or not. And we, to tell you the truth, we haven't returned to the topic. We figure there's so many bioenergy specialists pounding away that they can take it from here. We just hope they'll pay attention to what the cap is. All right, thanks very much. I think we can, oh, we have another one else. Simon has to take one last, one last swipe. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's a, uh, my question is, uh, so you nearly came to JPL twice, right? But you didn't come. So what do you think we should have done and what would you have done had you come to JPL? It wasn't anything about JPL. It's what, about everything outside the gates. So there's so, not... <laughs> so what, okay, so what should we have done then? Oh, my God. Well, you just have to recruit somebody that isn't a country hick. <laughs> what science should we have done? That's what I'm trying to get. Oh, what, what science should you have done that you didn't do? Yeah. Would, oh, would we have yeah. done if you had been here? Wow, I never thought of it that way. I, one of the things that I think would have been very interesting for me and hopefully would have made some kind of difference, when we designed MODIS, and it, um, we were on the design team from you know the very first blank page. And for me as a trained ecologist, not as an engineer or a physicist or any anything like that, I was I just found it fascinating the trade space. 
uh, they would ask us what we want. And of course, uh, we said we want everything all the time. And uh, they'd say, well, now we can only measure this and this and this, no matter what you want. This is what's measurable. And we go, oh, okay. And, and the, the interaction back and forth of optimizing the sensor design to both what the scientific questions were and what physical reality is, and then, of course, what budget reality is. I, I learned so much doing that, and I suspect you do that here all the time because your sensor designer and builders are literally right here, and so you can have that interaction just every week. And that must be very much fun, and uh, I would have loved to have gotten Frosty Sat going, because um, I still think that'll someday emerge as a useful global metric. Uh, I don't think SMAP right now is paying much attention to it. it isn't what really drove the mission. But uh, um, I, I think that is, is so valuable, and it's something hard, very few places you have any chance to do that. I mean, the sensor developers are usually in a different state or a different country than you are. And uh, here, you're all together. And I've more than once kind of envied that. Uh, but I, I could not handle life here. If I just stayed at work all the time, maybe I could have made it, but <laughs> this basin's too much for me. 12 lane freeways going in four directions. And I can't do it. Okay, well, thanks very much. Let's, uh, thanks. Okay. Thank Dr. Running one more time. <laughs>